I'm here with Dr. Dave, Dr. Dave Viscotchel from University of Utah. Uh, Dr. Viscotchel, you have been around the foundation for many, many years and are a specialist in NF. Could you talk about what your work has focused on over the past years and what you look to work on in the future? Well, that could be an extensive question. I've been with the CTF in the old days, back when it was the National Neurofibromatosis Foundation, as part of the Young Investigator Award. That was what initially brought me into the fold, if you will. I was working with Ray White at the time, and we were in direct competition with the University of Michigan, identifying the uh, working towards identifying the NF1 gene. And so I happened to come into Ray White's lab at the at the right time where he needed an extra pair of hands working on molecular biology of, um, of NF1 and that uh, got me pushed into the field if you will and once I met the families I never left. So from that start I continued to, to work on the molecular biology of NF1 um, primarily focusing on malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors, which I thought was at that time somewhat neglected. Of course, now it's not. We recognize that sarcomas are a huge um, component of NF1 in the adult population. And then uh, another uh, neglected area was bone. And I happen to have a collaborator, David Stevenson, who got very tuned into tibial pseudarthrosis in the in the late 1990s as a, um, as a medical student and he's never left the fold once he got to meet some of the families as well. So all along that time frame I was training for my, uh, my role as a clinical geneticist and part of that was to take on the role of, of a clinician in a NF clinic and so I've, I've been working with families in Utah for the last 25 some odd years. We have a very active NF community and we reached out to them and we've got some questions and one question here is from Sheila from email and she asks is there any way to get a protocol for kids with NF? Uh, what I mean is some guidelines for the parents to follow when questioning you know, what age to get an MRI, what doctor to go to, etc. What has been your experience there? Could you help Sheila? Well Sheila this is a very appropriate question I think to pose for my role as the chair for the clinical care advisory board. When our board comes together, we ask these same questions. And it boils down to, are there evidence-based guidelines that can allow us to say, without doubt, this is the appropriate protocol to follow? And to date, we don't have that kind of information that we can be unequivocal saying this is the protocol that one needs to follow. And so what we've generally done is we've brought together the different clinics around the country who see a number of patients with both NF1, NF2, and schwannomatosis so that we can share these ideas of what are the different protocols in place at different sites. And there are certain recognized guidelines and primarily working with a physician who's tuned in to issues related to NF1, NF2, schwannomatosis, the protocols for imaging, the protocols for um, assessments for learning disabilities. These are things that each of the clinics have integrated into their own clinic style. And it may be that they have different expertise at different sites. But my, my role when I hear this question is the first um, response is, well, where are you? Where do you live? And do you have an NF clinic nearby? Do you have a pediatrician or a general practitioner who's willing to make a referral to that clinic? And even if it's one time a year to be evaluated, that's enough to set the sort of the protocol that that particular clinic may follow. Each clinic may be a little different, but there are generalized guidelines that we all tend to follow. Primarily, I think, as we come together with meetings like this, and we we have questions. This same question haunts us because we all want to know what is the most appropriate protocol and we're not entirely sure but at least we have guidelines that drive us and the bottom line is that each individual is drives that protocol. So instead of just arbitrarily saying that everyone with this particular condition needs to follow a specific protocol, we like to integrate it in with what that particular individual's needs are, what their age is, and what kind of experiences that family has had in the past. Hope that covers it. <laughs> I think so. Okay, along that same line, uh, 
I hear on radio, I see on TV, the discussion about having individuals get their own genes mapped. I'm not familiar with this. Is that a possibility? Is that a possibility today? Is that something we're going to see in the future? And how does that play into our patients with NF? So the question really focuses on how, how much genetic information do you want to know about your own genome? And that's a tough question regardless of if you have NF1 in your family or NF of any kind in your family. And it's a personal choice because there's information that we can glean from that genomic screen that could potentially identify modifiers that may make or may help identify those individuals who may be more prone perhaps to bone problems in, for NF1, perhaps uh, the um, ependymomas for NF2. But there's also other information that you get that you may not want to know about. And so what I share with my families, not just um, individuals who are touched by NF, but the, the families who are interested in genetic testing, because there's a lot more information that's there and you have to realize that there may be information that we don't have any kind of treatments for, and it may have a large impact in your life as well as other family members. As long as families are aware of that possibility, aware of that uh, that, that this is uh, a choice that they're making themselves and that there may be information that could be gleaned um, from that mapping genetic testing, um, it's okay. But they're going in with an informed choice. They've had counseling beforehand and they're not just dialing up a number and saying, here's my, uh, here's my DNA, please sequence it and send it back to me in the mail and I'll try to figure this out. It, it's complex enough that you need someone to help walk through that with you. How much does something like that cost? Presently, to, to sequence the entire, um, well, if we just, let's look at the exome, and it varies who you talk to, but it's in the realm of uh, up around $5,000. Now, if you do two genetic tests, and I'm not saying for NF1, NF2, schwannomatosis, it, it's, if you do tests for some other genetic condition, it may cost you $5,000 to do the genetic test, and that's all you have is that specific gene that you're looking at. Whereas by doing the full genome, or the exome sequencing, you get information from 30,000 some odd genes. How to piece that together, of course, that's a, a fairly long counseling session that we'd have with the families. But we are at that point now where maybe you get the full genome sequenced and you only look at, at areas that you're interested in and you disregard the rest and you come back to it later when somebody's a little older, when they're at risk for colon cancer. You might want to try to uncover, well, do I harbor a, a predisposition gene for colon cancer? At age 8, you don't really care. At age 38, you're starting to wonder about screens, and so it becomes much more important information at that time. Excellent. Things to be aware of, but with caution. So, Dr. Viscotchel, thank you very much for your time and efforts. Great to be here.